When we offer presentations to adults like you who work with children or care for children in some way, there are always a lot of questions about child maltreatment. We wanted to get you answers from the professionals who work with these issues every day. We also want you to understand when and how to take action and how to be prepared. But more than anything, we want you to know how incredibly important your role is in helping keep children safe. Child maltreatment happens in all different types of families, irrespective of uh, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, uh, anything. It happens in all different types of families. Over 90% of child maltreatment is committed by someone that the child knows or is familiar to them. Child maltreatment can happen uh, within the family, within close friends of the family, the children's school, ball teams, things like that. A lot of times we teach our kids stranger danger, but really it's uh, we need to train them to look out for abuse in general. I met a um, man who abused me through my church. He was my children's pastor. I wanted people to know that I was friends with him and he knew who I was and it was just, that was something that was really valued. At that time I saw him as so fun, somebody that I could relate to, somebody that I really wanted them to like me. I really wanted to um, gain their approval. My relationship with Ryan started as more of a friendship where he would come to my school for lunch and all of that and then it moved to he would ask me to volunteer at the church and I would go up there and I would be the only volunteer to show up. It just didn't seem weird at the time I guess but looking back now it's like why did that ever happen? Each year there are over three million reports of child maltreatment in the United States through neglect, physical abuse and sexual abuse. And while the number of cases remains about the same with neglect, we've really started to move the needle on physical abuse and sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is actually one of the biggest safety problems that we encounter with children. Um, one in ten children will become a victim of sexual abuse before they reach the age of 18. Sexual abuse in a child starts with grooming of the child. That is when the perpetrator will develop a relationship with the child, establish trust with the child, and then maintain that sexual relationship between the perpetrator and the victim in secrecy. Every time I was around him, he would say, you know, I'm doing this because you've earned it. I'm doing this because I want to spend time with you. And I was thinking, oh, I need to keep acting the way I'm acting in order to receive his attention. He sees me, I'm important, and um, just thinking, like, that's so cool. The abuse happened, I mean, it was over span. It really started in, like, second grade. I didn't know that it was abuse. I just saw it was always a game. It was always something, you know, he made it. Um, and just seeming fun and normal and I just kind of believed him because I trusted him. A lot of times the perpetrators are trusted family members or friends and so for them they may like the perpetrator and so they don't want to get them in trouble. Sometimes the perpetrator will bribe the child or threaten them to hurt them or their family members. Sometimes the perpetrator may blame the child, uh, make them feel like it's their fault, their idea, and so they feel embarrassed and shameful and so they don't want to disclose the abuse. Ryan came over to one of my friend's houses and she said, isn't it funny how he picks us up? Nobody else picks us up like that. It must, you know, it's just kind of silly that he does that. His entire demeanor changed. He got angry. And I remember him saying, Kristen, it's probably best if you didn't tell anybody the way I picked you up. And I was humiliated. I thought I had done something horribly, horribly wrong. I was so embarrassed. I just decided from that point on, I will never tell another soul because of how I feel right now, how, how little he made me feel. And I always felt so special because of him. If a child does disclose abuse, it's a process and it's not a single event. Um, at first, the child may deny that the abuse ever occurred or they may begin to share tiny amounts of information of the abuse just to kind of test the waters and see how the adults around them respond to it. For a child, the consequences of exposing abuse um, often outweighs the consequences of enduring it. I eventually told um, my mom I didn't want to, but I think she began to see signs that it was odd that he was still coming over and um, wanting to maintain that relationship. She just asked me, does Ryan touch you differently? And I was like, took a long time to answer her, but eventually I just said, yeah, he does. It's not a big deal. Totally try to play it off, like, Mom, please don't blow this out of proportion. Like, I honestly didn't really understand that what he had been doing was wrong. I honestly didn't. After they have disclosed, their lives can become very stressful, and so a lot of times they may realize that life was a little bit easier before, and so they want to 
so that that never happens so that everything can go back to normal. Going to counseling all the time and going to trial hearings and going to all that stuff doesn't make you feel very normal. At that time I remember thinking, I wish I wouldn't have said something. And then it, now, looking back, how thankful I am that I did and that my mom handled it the way that she did to um, get me the help that I needed. Anytime a child does disclose abuse, we need to take it very seriously. Children really have nothing to gain from making up a story of abuse, and so rarely is it untrue that it had happened. In addition to verbal disclosures of abuse, there are other uh, important indicating um, factors such as an inadequate home environment or inadequate caregiving. Anytime, of course, you see a non-accidental um, injury in a child, those should always re be reported. Examples of that might be um, pattern injuries, which are injuries that take on the likelihood of the object that was used to inflict them, such as belts or cords, things like that. Bruising that are not on bony prominences, which are, those are common places for injuries, so non-bony prominent injuries are uncommon. Anything that appears to be recurring, such as an illness that doesn't seem to be taken care of or continues to come back, or repeated injuries that seem similar, like broken bones or um, just common injuries over and over again, those are also things that would be concerning and need to be reported. It's important to never understate or overstate the impact of trauma. Uh, adolescents try to cope with trauma in a variety of different ways, from substance abuse, self-harm, oftentimes they develop eating disorders, and uh, have a propensity to delinquency or even criminal behavior. The impact of trauma is broad and can vary from child to child. Some children are not affected at all, and some children have long-term consequences. Research shows that children's brains undergo changes when they're subjected to trauma. Um, even at the cellular level. Sometimes we label those children as the kids with behavior problems. They may have things like oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD. Oftentimes children's behaviors are the signs and symptoms of other forms of trauma that require treatment um, and it also can be a cue that further evaluation is needed. You want to take into consideration any extremes in behaviors, children that are reluctant to go certain places or be around certain people. Anytime children have what you would consider inappropriate sexual behavior or sexual behavior that is more than what should be um, at that child's level of knowledge. I think it's important to remember that some children never tell somebody about their abuse because nobody's bothered to ask. Once a child discloses what's happened and by whom, it's really important that you don't question the child any further or ask the child to repeat what had happened to another adult. Asking leading questions and probing for more details can sometimes distress a child or can cause them to confuse the, their memory of the events. This can run the risk of obstructing an investigation. So it's best for a trained interviewer to conduct an interview with the child and get all the facts in a way that's objective, legally defensible, and most importantly, minimizes further trauma. It's really important that the adult remain uh, calm, express to the child that they believe the child, uh, that they not um, question the child about how this could happen or indicate that the child somehow caused the maltreatment. It's important for their reaction to be objective and to provide a lot of verbal reassurance to the child that they believe them that they're going to provide for their safety. The next morning my mom woke me up and she said we're not going to go to school today and she took me to a place called the Care Center which was a child's advocacy center. My parents didn't really go into it. I guess they were just kind of like, oh, bro, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing today. I remember the girl who interviewed me, I thought she was the coolest person ever. It was just her and I felt so comfortable. Children tend to feel responsible for the reactions of adults and so it's important uh, that uh, the adults remain calm and that helps the children progress in telling their story uh, and making sure that their own needs are being met. Anytime you don't know how to answer a question uh, from a child about the abuse or what will happen with the investigation, it's okay to tell them that you don't know. Tell them that you will talk with those people and try to get an answer for them or you will try to find someone that can answer their question. Oklahoma statutes require anybody that has a suspicion of child abuse to report that 
to DHS or to the police. They don't have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that this is occurring. They just have to have suspicion that it's occurring. We don't want that adult to try to investigate that themselves. We want them to immediately report that to the police or to the DHS hotline. Prompt reporting is very important to us so that we can take action. If an adult believes that a child is in imminent danger, they should call the police or call 911 immediately. One of the first things that they're going to be asked for is demographic information. How somebody found out about the abuse, whether it was from the child or from a third party, did they walk in on it? If the child actually made a disclosure of abuse, then they will want to know what specific statement did this child make. We ask the people that are reporting to understand that they're not to discuss the report to the families or to the victim or to anybody that might relay that information. There's potential for retribution on the child if the suspect knows that we're investigating him prior to us beginning our investigation. He or she has the opportunity to establish an alibi, destroy evidence, stuff that's very important in a criminal investigation. I'm just so thankful that my parents handled it the way they did and they responded as quickly as they did as soon as they learned that something was off. From that everything just kind of came out and a lot of other girls came forward. On my 12th birthday after I visited the care center, um, kind of shared my story, Ryan was, a, was arrested. There were adults in my life that I know did see abuse happen and they did know that it was going on and it was something swept under the rug. That was honestly more hurtful to me than my abuser doing what he did because I realized you know he had an illness and he was sick but the healthy adults in my life that didn't do anything that was that was way more hurtful. Hurt people hurt people and so it's essential that reporting is made it's essential that we respond to those reports in a prompt way and provide good assessment uh, for kids because ultimately what we want to do is break the cycle of child abuse. Thank you so much for taking some time today to learn more about child maltreatment. We know because of the roles that you're in that you care deeply for children as we do. And we want to always make sure that you know that it's up to all of us to help keep children safe.